Hi everyone, welcome to Five Quote Shakespeare Twelfth Night Act 3. What I do in this series is I first give you a nutshell overview of the important plot events of each scene, and then we dive deeply into the text of each scene and pull out five or more quotes that I think you find useful to help you understand the play's character, theme, and plot. If you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe, and if you make a donation, I'll send you a complete set of the PDFs I use in this series. See the description for details. Act 3, scene 1 is a bit of an odd scene. It's, uh, it's got three micro scenes in it, actually. It starts off with the Feste and Viola meeting each other, and then the, uh, the buffoons enter and meet Viola, and then there's a, quite a tender scene at the end here where Olivia opens up her heart to the person she loves or thinks she loves. Um, so it starts off with Viola encountering Feste as, as, she, as she approaches Olivia's house. Again, she's come to, to, to argue the case for Orsino. They exchange witty banter about the slipperiness of words, equivocation, appearance versus reality, some of the dominant themes that we've talked about already and you should be aware of, and the foolishness of human folly and desire, love, again, one of the dominant themes that you should be aware of. Uh, Viola admires the fool's intelligence, and I think that's a comment, uh, that's Shakespeare's comment on the importance of comedy, so we'll talk about that today too. So in sharp contrast to that, uh, uh, that really fun, intelligent, witty banter, uh, we, get, we get the real buffoons entering, we get these guys entering, and it's, it's anything but witty and intelligent. It's funny though. So in sharp contrast, sirs Toby and Andrew arrive. Andrew tries but fails to impress Viola with his poor French. Remember, he sees her, him, as a rival in the, effect, in, in, in the battle for the affections of Olivia. Uh, so what Shakespeare's doing here, he's, he's contrasting the high and the low. The foolish fool is this guy, and the wise fool, of course, is Feste. And it's the, the unworthy characters versus the worthy characters. I'm not sure uh, uh, Feste's on the edge in terms of worthiness, but certainly Viola is one of the worthy characters, and so we see a contrast here. Um, the play, the, this particular scene, it's a convergent scene. The, to the high and the low plots have been parallel until this time, and in this particular scene we see the high and the low plot characters actually converging and meeting each other, so that's, that's kind of neat. Okay, so then uh, Olivia enters and Olivia sends everyone away and then alone Olivia apologizes for manipulating Viola with uh, the ring ploy. You'll remember in a previous scene uh, that she, she, Olivia tried to get Viola to return by pretending that, that she gave, uh, that Orsino gave uh, a ring uh, to Viola to give to Olivia. So it was, a, it was an entire ploy. Again, the parents versus reality deception. So in this scene, as I mentioned, it, there's, there's a quite, a, it's, a, it's a comedy of errors. It's funny because uh, she doesn't know who she's, Olivia doesn't know who she's talking to. She thinks she's talking to a guy and she thinks she's in love with this guy, but of course she's not. So it, it's funny in that sense. It, it is a comedy of errors, uh, a meeting scene, but there's also some tenderness here because Olivia opens up her heart. She declares her love for Viola Cesario. Now, how is, how is uh, uh, Viola going to handle that? That's, that's the big question here. And here we see her, her heart is breaking for the deception that she's, that, that she's imposing upon uh, uh, the, the victim, Olivia. It's, 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 it's an interesting scene. There's a ton of tension here. So Viola has to equivocate in her response. She can't say, oh, by the way, I'm not who you think I am. I'm a girl and you, you don't love me really. So sorry to break your heart. She can't do that. She compassionately, but firmly rejects Olivia's love. She has to keep up the facade. She has to keep lying to everybody, pretending to be someone that she's not, but she firmly rejects uh, uh, the love overtures. So Viola then exits, and then at the very, very end, Olivia, again, we, we see what we want to see. We hear what we want to hear. Olivia still remains hopeful despite uh, having that firm rejection. So at the very, very end, deception remains and the wasteland is not healed. So we're going to talk about that today. The fact that this, the whole complication of the play uh, uh, it remains in place because the deceptions haven't been revealed yet. And that's really, really important. Okay, so let's have a look, quick look at dramatic form. So as I mentioned, there is a convergence of the high and the low plots, the sub and the main plots. These characters meet for the first time. Uh, we see the contrast of the buffoonery of these clowns, okay, and it contrasts sharply with the, uh, the, the nobility of these characters, the tragic, the potentially tragic nobility of these two characters here, okay, so there's the pathos, and by the end of the scene, I'm, I'm going to argue, uh, there is real pathos in, in, in this scene. It, it's perhaps the most uh, pathetic uh, scene so far.
Um, the main, in terms of the main plot, uh, it is a comedy of errors confrontation. Okay, so this is totally a comedy of errors. It's the mistaken identity, and there's all these. Uh, there's a great opportunity for, uh, uh, um, you know, misunderstandings and 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 comic irony and all of that stuff, tinged as I've mentioned with that sense of uh, sense of sense of pathos. So dramatic irony, tension is established there. Uh, the lack of resolution causes frustration and suspense, and it drives the narrative forward. Remember, we're not at the climax yet, so things can't be resolved yet. We need more tension. We need more raising of the stakes to 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 keep that complication moving forward in an intense way towards the climax. And that's exactly what we get. The pathos of Olivia's open declaration of love. She bared all to this person who is not who she thinks she is and that really really raises the emotional stakes and that 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 keeps the series of complications moving forward towards the climax great seeing this the appearance versus reality deceptions equivocations riddles wordplay puns disguises starts off innocently enough with feste just doing what he does which is telling jokes and jokes rely on wordplay and deceptions and feints and everything else um, so it's actually quite funny here. Go back and watch again. Watch one of the versions. I, I recommend the 2012 to 2013 version. It's really, really funny. Um, a sentence is but a chevril glove to a good wit, says Feste. How quickly the wrong side may be turned outward. Now, what that refers to is a, a soft glove. The chevril glove is a soft-skinned glove which can be turned inside out. So he's talking about language being being malleable. Uh, you, you can corrupt it. And he calls himself, he is Olivia's corrupter of words. So again, it's quite innocent uh, in this context because they're having fun, but there's a darker, more sinister uh, uh, element to this because as we see, there's, there's, there's vicious deceptions going on in this play. I mean, not least of all is this cruel deception of of, of poor Olivia, who's being manipulated mercilessly, more or less, by a, a noble character, but a, a flawed noble character, I suppose. We have, to, we, have to, we have to think about these things. So Viola says, uh, nay, that's certain. They are that they that dally nicely with words may quickly make them wanton. And that means wayward and, and, and going off the, the straight and narrow path. So words are, 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 are foxy creatures, is what they're saying. Words are very rascals. So the scene opens with this, and that's important because because deception, disguise, self-deception. Olivia is self-deceived. She sees in Viola what she wants to see, even though she gets the rejection, as I've mentioned. She's being manipulated and the use of words to manipulate. Now, as I've mentioned before, Viola is actually very clever, and she's manipulating her as sinisterly as... Mariah and Sir Toby and the gang are manipulating someone like Malvolio. That's a question that I'm going to um, I'm, we're going to explore in this particular uh, uh, video. Feste continues to be rascally with words throughout this scene, uh, and and Viola is trying to trying to remember where she saw this 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 guy, and he she says, "I saw thee late at Count Orsino's. And, and Feste says, well, it's not surprising that you saw a fool at the Count Orsino's because foolery, sir, does walk about the orb like the sun. It shines everywhere. It's a, that's a great line. It's a really great line. And it's a great global theme statement for almost all of literature, maybe, how foolish how foolish human beings are. Uh, we are the agents of our own destruction. That's a comment on that, that, that we can't. It's the sad inevitability of human folly. We can't avoid it. And maybe all of tragedy and all of comedy relies to this. If you can't, we laugh at ourselves. That's what comedy is, right? We're laughing at our stupidities. And so that's, that's that great, great statement about, about what it means to be human. We are the agents of our own destruction. Uh, the old notion of the ship of fools, that's what we all are. It's the, the, the planet is a ship of fools going about its merry and not so merry way uh, our own arrogance our own ignorance we don't know who we are we could we could tack on to this this little um this little quote here uh, the the dual nature of music beauty and love and feeling how deceptive they can be okay we seek what 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 seeks to destroy us very very often that's the will of the wisp theme that we have talked about several times the will of the wisp motif that swamp gas that creates a light in a swamp at night that leads us not to a sh not to shelter but to to uh, to deeper into the swamp to our doom okay so uh the witty banter continues uh th there's a rhythmic flow to this that is actually quite nice uh that that is very very pleasing to the audience's ear uh the, the banter back and forth the, the the seamless intelligence of the conversation and wordplay is very very satisfying it's not awkward at all 
And Viola, once, the, once Feste exits, Viola makes a comment on that. She says, this, this fellow is wise enough to play the fool, and to do that well craves a kind of wit. You can't, in order to be a good comedian, in order to be a good fool, you have to be smart. And so she comments on that, and she actually extends this. So when you watch the video, you'll see it's a little bit, it's a soliloquy, it's a small soliloquy. She turns to the audience and she says, isn't, isn't it satisfying? Isn't it, isn't it nice to be in the presence of, of, of a truly wise generous minded wit who can who can carry a conversation who can who can make the conversation flow very in a very satisfying way so here's viola it, this this little bit here reveals something about viola she is intelligent she's wise she's the wise observer she's very much like feste here she can get above the action and she can comment on it like the greek chorus and like a feste so she recognizes and she appreciates she, she, she is very satisfied by that encounter, and she comes out with a little smile on her face, and, 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 and the dopamine kicking off in her head, I suppose, in contrast. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm beefing that up a bit because I want to contrast it with this gross awkwardness, very unsatisfying encounter that happens next. Okay, so we also, of course, this is a commentary on Feste. He is the wise observer. He's the Greek chorus. Go back and watch my theme video. We'll, you'll, you'll hear more about uh, the Greek chorus. And, of course, it's Shakespeare's defense of comedy. Uh, comedy is very often, even today, uh, we don't give, you know, we don't give, the Americans don't give Academy Awards to comedies all that often because they're not considered serious comedians or kind of, you know, the, the, the basement dwellers of the entertainment industry and the law Lofty hamlets are the ones that are getting all of the all of the accolades and the respect. Well, here's maybe Shakespeare saying, uh, uh, you know, the comedians deserve as much respect as anybody else. If that encounter was satisfying, the next encounter is definitely not. Sir Toby and Sir Andrew enter and they greet Viola in, in a very pretentious, awkward and artificial way. Sir Toby says, will you encounter the house in this pretentious tone? And if you look up that word, uh, that word used in this context is, was, was very pretentious. It was, it was this artificial, pretentious way of speaking. And again, it's in sharp contrast to what we just saw. The satisfying high wit Okay, now we get this low buffoonery wit, and that's in contrast again with the, with the sensitivity of the final encounter of the scene between uh, 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 Olivia, who, who, who does sincerely reveal her love for, for someone who, who, who she thinks she loves. Okay, uh, so Sir Toby, there's Sir Toby with his pretension, and Sir Andrew uh, 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 is, is not so much pretentious as just foolish and artificial. Uh, so before that, uh, Sir Toby says, uh, taste your legs, sir, put them in motion. Again, there's an awkward construction here, but Viola picks it up and she plays the feste and she, she makes a really clever, witty rejoinder. She says, taste my legs? What are you talking about? My legs do better stand under me. It means my legs do better understand me, sir, than I understand what you mean by bidding me taste my legs. So again, it's this awkward, weird, pretentious construction. Viola tries to pick up the tennis match here and get the wit going back and forth, but it doesn't quite work, okay? So here we see Viola being intelligent, witty. She's, she's playing the feste. She's the corrupter of words here, giving as good as she gets. Uh, but but uh, the ball isn't picked up by these other two buffoons. So uh, Olivia and Mariah enter, and Viola uses her words, uh, whether sincere or not, but they're kind of formulaic words to greet uh, a countess. And so Sir Andrew here, he's taking notes, DC. Odors, pregnant, these are the words that Viola uses, you know, vouch safed. I'll get them all three already. He's taking notes. So there's an insincerity and artificiality to the exchange that, again, is in sharp contrast to the sincerity that we're going to see below and the, the witty cleverness of what we've seen above okay so appearance versus reality equivocation puns word games it's all here in 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 a, in a debased form compared to what we've seen previously and compared to the sincerity that we're going to see now okay so the clowns exit and viola and olivia are left alone Viola and Olivia greet each other, and Viola says, I'm here to plead Orsino's case. And Olivia, in a kind of uh, semi-heroic attempt to heal the wasteland by dispelling all of the deceptions, which is the requirement for the healing of the wasteland in Aurelia, as we've been discussing and as we will discuss, uh, she says, give me leave, beseech you. I did send after the last enchantment you did hear a ring in chase of you, and so did I abuse myself, my servant, and I fear me, you. That's the wasteland. Uh, that's, those are the lies that people are telling themselves and others that is keeping it really locked in, it, in, its, uh, in its trapped 
uh, state in this paralysis is what it is. And so here is, there's one deception has been revealed, but because she, because Viola doesn't reveal the truth to uh, Olivia, then the wasteland continues. And that's important because we're not at the end of the play yet. Okay, so the other element I want to talk about here is the word enchantment. Again, so when you're doing literature analysis, these some words should shine off the page at you and make you pause. So it's all word choice. The author chooses word A and not word B for a reason. And so Shakespeare throws the word enchantment in here, I think, to support what we've seen already, the dual nature of love, the messiness of love. We've seen it in Midsummer Night's Dream. Love is a spell, a magic spell that can be wonderful, but it can also be very, very deceptive. So here's the dual nature of love. Love as a spell, as magic, as a dangerous will-o'-the-wisp, the ignis fatuus, okay? Uh, the power to lure and deceive. That's what love can do. So that's definitely part of this play. Uh, and then the, 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 the we see what we want to see theme uh, becomes very, very evident in this next exchange. Uh, in a clever return to the bear baiting motif, it comes up a lot in this play, as, as we've already seen. Uh, o Olivia accuses Viola of setting her heart at a stake uh, and, and loosing the hounds of love on, on her. Okay, and, and so, so that's definitely one of the motifs about the dual nature of love. Uh, the reply to that is, I pity you. And so she, Viola, Olivia responds hilariously, oh, well, pity is very similar to love. That must be love, right? We're almost there, right? Well, here again, we see the appearance versus reality. We see what we want to see, the self-deceptions. Olivia is projecting here like exactly the same way that Malvolio was um, uh, projecting when he read the the letter that that uh, Mariah wrote, there's no difference. They're all the same. We are the ship of fools. Uh, foolery walks under the sun everywhere, as Feste said. And look up here too. The bear baiting motif was used by Orsino. He in his narcissistic, you know, adolescent reveries about love. He says, "My heart is the bear, and the hounds of love are tearing me apart." Uh, it, we are, yeah, we're, we're such fools. And Shakespeare is so cleverly interweaving this into all of his characters. Okay, so Viola tries to try, Viola is the voice of wisdom here, along with Feste, as I've been arguing. And Viola says, no, 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 no. It, it's this, this pity and love are not the, quite the same things because we very often pity our enemies. And so again, Viola hears what she wants to hear here. She doesn't, she doesn't take it the way that Viola intends it. She says, why me thinks it is time to smile again? Because if I am your enemy indeed, or we are enemies here and you're pitying me as an enemy, I would rather be torn apart by a lion than a mere wolf, do you see? So again, she's twisting this in, in the most ridiculous fashion uh, to, to make it suit her own particular needs, okay? So here's Viola uh, uh, again. Is she justified in these manipulations? She's torturing, uh, she is a bear. She's a bear being tortured by the hounds of Viola here. And so is she justified in herself, in, in her deceptions here? Is she as bad as Mariah and Toby, uh, who we cheer on, but we know that there's, there's something kind of sinister about that. And we're told by Shakespeare at the end of the play that there's something sinister about their manipulations of Malvolio. So the grand theme of manipulation is it ever justified? The dual nature of love, music, deception as the will of the wisp, as we've just talked about. Okay, and then the clock strikes. The clock is uh, is a universal symbol that that is always going to represent the passing of time in one way or another in whatever art form you find it. So there are these universal symbols like a clock or a mirror is always going to represent some kind of self-reflection. So pay attention to those when you see them in a work of art. And so Olivia's response is basically a theme statement for the entire play. The clock upbraids me with the waste of time. The clock upbraids everyone in this play with the waste of time. So that's the grand theme. The most important theme of the whole play, I think, is the time wasting or appearance versus reality. I don't know, maybe they, maybe they compete for, for, for top prize. The theme of time wasting is revealed here. The clock is actually a memento mori. And again, go back and watch my theme videos and you'll see uh, what I say about memento mori. A reminder that, you know, time is finite and live your life well, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so the clock is, is, is the thing that's waking, it is love. Clock is, it, the clock is love. The clock chimes and it wakes up the sleeping beauty. Uh, there, there's terrible irony here, though, because she's still wasting her time with the wrong person. Remember, she locked herself for seven years. She promised she would never love and never, never enjoy life ever again. Love comes, 
the Hagrid calling to life, the love of love as call to life comes, wakes up the Sleeping Beauty. She comes out into the into the world now. She is. She's had. She's she's removed her veil. There's the big, you know, when she first removes the veil and she's shocked to see what what life and love have to offer. So she is participating now. But the irony here, of course, is that she's she's still messed up. She's still wasting her time because she's wasting her time with the wrong person. Um, something else to talk about in this regard is the, is is change. I've talked about change in metamorphosis and anagnorosis and things like that. What she she has changed. She's 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 the worm that's emu- that has emerged from its cocoon to find a hostile world because she's in the wrong place. But she's going to work that out by the end of the play. Now, anagnorosis is a bit of a question here. Anagnorosis again, my theme video discusses this. It's that moment where the character in a in a movie or a play or whatever they they actually they realize what their true situation is, and here she's. Kind of, she kind of has. She 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 knows, and she said before in, in a previous scene. She says, "Wow, love is actually not so bad. I'm glad I'm not doing this anymore." Is basically what she says. So she, there is an awareness here that she is engaging with the world, but her true anagnosis doesn't arrive until the very very end of the play when she's actually, where it's actually revealed to her that she's in love with Sebastian, who is basically the same character as as Viola, um, but that doesn't come until the end. Uh, the dual, dual nature of love here. Uh, this we see is the positive kind of love. It's, it, it's a call to engagement with the world as opposed to the love that she had, obsessive love and gloomy love that she had for her, her dead brother. But again, it's a triple nature of love here. It's not mournful and obsessive uh, for, for the passing of a loved one. Uh, it is positive, but it's also the trickster love, the trickster God love, the, the, the self-deception, the will-o'-the-wisp uh, love uh, that is leading her down the wrong path. The self-deception continues and only intensifies right up to the end of the whole scene. Uh, Olivia tries to let Viola go. She tries to be the mature grown-up and says, okay, well, there's your way. Go ahead. And then she can't stop herself. She says, so stay. What do you think of me? She asks that question that every lovesick adolescent asks of their girlfriend or boyfriend. And Viola responds, I think that you do think you are not what you are. So there again is the appearance versus reality, the, the deception that is being perpetuated by Viola, remember. That's something that, we, that's a question we have to keep asking ourselves. You know, there's three layers of meanings to this. Uh, it's you do not consider yourself a noble woman, so she's acting undignified. You do not see that you are in love with a woman, so there's the obvious uh, deception. And you don't, you don't realize how crazy you are. You don't realize that you're out of your mind. So again, appearance versus reality, deception, all over the place, self-deception as well as the the cruel deceptions of Viola. We see what we want to see, self-deception, the dual nature of love, of course, being positive and also very, very deceptive. We are approaching the crescendo of the the emotional crescendo of the scene, and, and it is quite emotional indeed. Uh, but just before that, uh, Olivia ha- has a great projection statement. She says, I wish you were as I would have you be. Now, isn't that the truth? Projection. We project our ideal onto the object of desire very, very often. And I've said this before in Romeo and Juliet, we see it played out very, very clearly. Uh, we don't love the, in- we very often don't love the individual. Certainly not at the beginnings of love because we don't know that individual yet. We love our projection of the ideal lover onto that uh, object of desire, uh, which is what Romeo does with uh, Rosalind and, of course, Juliet at the beginning. Uh, so that, that's a great statement of appearance versus reality. Projection, we see what we want to see. And that continues here as well. In an aside, Olivia says, Oh, what a deal of scorn looks beautiful in the, in the contempt and anger of his lip. Now, remember... Uh, Viola's not having fun here at all. Uh, Olivia is. She, she's the, her heart is open for the first time in a long time. She's engaging with happiness again. She's engaging with the world. And so she, she's enjoying herself, kind of, of course. It's bittersweet. Uh, oh, Viola not. She, she's in agony. She's in agony here, and her face is showing it. It's like she's like, oh, lady, 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 lady. And Olivia sees that, but what does she see? Does she see, see rejection? No. She sees what she wants to see. She sees, even in that kind of scorn that I see in your face, you look beautiful, do you see? Then she decides, uh, now this is, this is really interesting. It's actually quite touching and moving. And if, again, if you go watch this movie version, 2012, 2013, if you watch this version, it's actually quite moving. A murder's guilt shows not itself more soon than love that would seem hid. Love's night is noon. And what she's saying here is that uh, you can't hide love. 
it will show itself. And so here is her firm decision to say, I'm going to take the great leap. I'm going to, 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 to I'm, I'm going in whole hog. I'm not going to hold back. No more deception, no more falsehoods. I'm going to reveal the truth. I'm going to reveal my heart here. And that's the heroic leap. Cesario, she says, and listen to the elevation of the language here. We see the end rhyme here, and it's very, very beautiful, uh, and, and that continues right through to the end. So there's a, this is a sincere moment. Cesario, by the roses of the spring, by maidenhood, honor, truth, and everything. I love thee so, that despite all your pride, because here's the stern face that feel is, is, is returning, nor wit nor reason can my passion hide. That's the heroic, uh, undeceiving moment. Appearance versus reality, a rejection of falsehood, a rejection of hiding, an open, sincere declaration of love, and that is what can cure the wasteland. Unfortunately, it, it, it can't happen yet because the other half of the love combination refuses to, uh, to, to fess up. By innocence I swear, and by my youth I have one heart, one bosom, and one truth, and that no woman has, nor never none shall mistress of my heart be, save I alone. So all Viola can do is continue with the equivocation, with the deception, with the falsehoods, and that's the failure to resolve the central conflict, and the wasteland remains unhealed. Um, now, there, there's an ele the, the, the elevated language continues, so Shakespeare wants us to see the whole scene as being elevated. She swears by her innocence, and that's questionable because she's, is she being innocent here? I really don't think so. But what the meaning of this is that I only have one heart, and, and no woman will ever be uh, the mistress of my heart except for me because I'm the only woman because I love a man. That's, that's, that's what that's all about. And so then she says goodbye. Um, so it is an elevated scene, and, and the scene coming up and the scenes previously, there's she's deceiving Olivia. Cruelly, certainly, but the the she's pained by it. She's in agony. She 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 doesn't want to be doing this. Should she have revealed what would happen if she revealed all now? She would lose her love for Orsino because everyone would be appalled and angry. I suppose um, I, I don't know. You, you you have to you have you have to kind of figure this out yourself. But do we blame her? That's the question I've been asking a, a lot in this play. Is that do we blame her for her de cruel deceptions? There's a difference here. There's a gleeful manipulation that we see in Mariah and Sir Toby uh, and and and, uh, and Fabian. But we don't see that glee here. Instead, we see pain. And so does that does that redeem Viola? That's a question for you to ask. Okay, uh, so at the very, very end, we do see there's a nobility versus baseness, as I've just talked about. The Sir Toby and, and Mariah manipulations are certainly base. Uh, these manipulations are noble. Keep asking the question. There's a flawed nobility here in Viola. There's an insincere, insincere sincerity, do you see? There's a destructive deception that, that, that she can, that she does not uh, 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 overcome in this, in these last, in these last moments of the scene. Uh, so the wasteland still remains unhealed. It still remains a wasteland. And that was the end of Twelfth Night, Act Three, Scene One. I hope you found it useful. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and let me know if you need a copy of the PDFs. Thanks for watching.